fits perfectly with what I'm going to be talking about tonight. How are you all doing tonight? Is there any water up here by chance, Pastor Collie, that I can drink? Nope, there's nothing. You're fired. <laughs> Let's see here. Let me get this open real quick. I don't have a paper copy of my sermon tonight. I'm going technical with it with the iPad tonight, so hopefully that'll streamline things for us. If you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, look at verse 25 starting out. Before I get started, uh, I just want to give you kind of a background of what inspired me with this sermon. As most of you know, I'm starting seminary and uh, answering God's call to preach in whatever capacity He's called me to do that. One thing that I found starting school is that it's very easy to get caught up and nervous and scared and anxious about assignments, getting things done on time, uh, writing sermons <laughs> for my class. Hey, look at this guy. Get him promoted. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that, brother. But uh, starting classes, it, it can be difficult. And even before that, I've said that I've had many passages in the Bible or verses that I highly relate myself to and think that that's my life verse. But I have a life scripture here for myself. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. We find Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount talking to a group of Jewish people who are under Roman oppression and under the oppression of sin, really. But we live in a world where it's very easy to get caught up in everything, don't we? We worry about a lot of stuff. And whenever I worry or I'm anxious, or I just can't focus on what really matters, I keep going back to Matthew chapter 6. It is here that Christ tells us not to be anxious. That's exactly what I want to talk about tonight. It's a plague that we've had since the beginning of time, and it's something we still struggle with today. It's getting worse and worse as time progresses. According to Webster's Dictionary, anxiety is a strong desire sometimes mixed with doubt, fear, or uneasiness. In other words, or simpler words, needless worry. I once made mention of a study that was done by Penn State University that made the claim that 8% of the things that we worry about on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, actually come true. Eight percent. That still leaves 92 percent of our worries that never come true. But I don't want to be ignorant to the fact that just because this statement is made and this study was done that we still struggle with this, don't we? We still struggle with anxiety. We still struggle with fear and worry because we're fallen, broken individuals. We're not going to be perfect every single time that we try to be. Oh, I'm going to have a great day today. I'm not going to worry about anything. Whatever my boss tells me to do, I'm going to do it. If something happens, no worries. It just doesn't work that way. The terrible side effects that anxiety brings are crushing for some. Anxiety is something that I have dealt with in my life a lot. It's not something that we're immune to. And it's nothing that a man can cure. No ordinary man can cure it. But there was one special man who did formulate a solution for it. That man being Jesus Christ. And it's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, that he gives our solution. But before we get into our passage, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you know what's on my heart tonight. And... I ask that you would be with me and you would give me your words, fill me with your spirit, cleanse me of all unrighteousness and prepare me to teach this congregation. I pray that you prepare their hearts as well and open their minds and be with the person in this congregation tonight who this message is specifically for. They would heed your word, Lord, as I have listened to your word. Please be with us now in your holy precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. And I'll read all the way through 34. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, 
nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. Neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whither all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I want to draw your attention first to our verse in chapter, or chapter 6, verse 25, the first part of verse 25. Look at that first phrase that Christ says. He says, take no thought. He then lists what not to take thought about. But I want to look at the word thought here. If we look at the Greek word for thought, it is marinao. We see that the original meaning of, or the definition of marinao is to be anxious or to be troubled with cares. So Christ says, take no time to be anxious or troubled with cares. I think it's also important to note that Christ does not ask us not to be anxious. He commands us. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought. In school, I'm learning (laughs) different forms of speech, and English has never been my most favorite subject, but one of the things I'm learning is a different form of phrase. It's called imperative. Imperative. It's an imperative sentence, and that means it has authority and it has a command. It's not a question. It's not interrogative. He commands us not to worry. So to be anxious or filled with worry, or about worldly cares, filled with worry cares, is to be in direct disobedience of God's command. How much easier would people's lives be if we lived in obedience to God in everything? Even still, we find ourselves in deep conflict because of our disobedience. Is it not true that we worry about having enough money to buy all these necessities that Christ is talking about? I believe the true issue of the matter shows itself in the form of an unhealthy desire. For example, we find the world itself worrying about having the most fancy vehicle to drive. How many cup holders it has? How many heated seats does it have? Or who has the latest form of the iPhone? Am I keeping up with the new camera specs? Or how about, I wonder if my house is bigger than my neighbor's. I don't think it is. Maybe I need to upgrade a little bit. I'm not satisfied with what God has given me. I don't think the apostles had iPhones. (laughs) And I don't think that they always had roofs to live under. I think we take for granted a lot of the things that we have. And I believe that we're all guilty of this at some point, wanting the next best thing, not being satisfied with what God has given us. We worry, we stress ourselves over having the best instead of being satisfied with the basic. Isn't that all we need? Isn't that what Christ says? He says, don't worry about what you eat or what you drink or what you put on. God knows what you need. So why are you worrying? We let ourselves get caught up in the worry of it all. Our sin distorts and makes us want more than is actually needed. We all have the, what that. We all have what we need from God, if we consider, even if we consider it to be basic. There's a phrase you've heard before, and, and it goes like this: "The world went and got itself into a hurry." Now, why did it do that? Because of worry. The world went and got itself a hurry because of worry. I think I'm going to patent that saying. It got in itself in a worry because of worldly cares. All we can see and think of 
is what's going on in the world around us. We get stuck in the present. Why? I believe God was wondering the same thing. Because Christ continues in his sermon. Which leads me to my next point. Christ's reasonable reasoning. In verse 26, we'll read it again. It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? A bird. It doesn't think about where its next meal is coming from, and it doesn't always know where it's going to sleep. It might have a nest, but that nest might get blown out by the wind. You don't know. But unconsciously or unwillingly knowing, they're trusting that God will provide for them everything they need. A bird doesn't wake up in the morning and question if it's going to fly. It knows it's going to fly. Why? Because God allows it to fly. We look at verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? It's a rhetorical question. I think that if we were there that day when Christ was talking to these people, this mass crowd, there would have been a lot of heads going like, mm, can't do it, or verbal, I can't do it. Okay, so why are you worrying? It's reasonable. His reasonable reasoning is if you can't do anything about your situation, only God can, what are you worrying about? Don't do it. God will take care of you and what you need. Worrying doesn't put food in your belly, and worrying doesn't put clothes on your back. God has equipped all of us with what we need to thrive on this earth. We just need to be patient and trust Him, like that hymn was saying. Trust in God. Verses 28 through 30 deal with our clothing. And how does Christ respond in verse 30 of our passage? Christ says, you only have a short time... On this earth. So don't spend your time worrying about useless things. Then he gets to the heart of the issue in the last part of verse 30. Christ says, O ye of little faith. O ye of little faith. The Israelites that Jesus was speaking to lacked faith in God's provision. And it was something that they were guilty of often. Will we as Christians do the same? You may be asking, how do we exercise our faith and where should we put our focus, Nick? The simple answer is to trust God and focus on Him. But I want to look further into that this evening. In verse 31 through 34, Christ offers a solution or a remedy for our anxiety and worldly cares. He begins with a reiteration of His command that He gave in verse 25. However, I want you to draw your attention to verse 32. The first part of verse 32 says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. At first I was thinking the Lord was offering a rebuke just to the Gentiles. Almost like a jab. But if we look at the verse in context, we have to look at who Christ was talking to during the Sermon on the Mount. Seeing as Christ was in Israel, he would have predominantly had a Jewish audience. Now, that's not to say that there wouldn't have been Gentiles present. In fact, there were. If we read Matthew chapter 4, verse 25, it gives us a little bit more of a context clue. It says, And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. The Decapolis had a lot of Greeks that resided there. They had many different gods as well, but there was Jews mixed in with these Greeks. And they followed Jesus. They were listening to his teachings. Christ gets into this, this example, this side by side. Think of it this way. You have a Gentile person and a Jewish person. On the one hand, a Gentile. Yeah, they have other gods, but are they really sure? They have multiple gods that they pray to because they're not sure which one to pray to for what they need. There's too many. But they don't know about the one true God. And then you have the Jewish nation. The ones that were chosen by God. They were provided for 
in their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. We all know this story. When the Israelites begged Moses for food and said, why have you brought us out here to die? Are we going to die of starvation? We had food back in Egypt to eat. We had onions. Onions. But that's how they weren't thinking straight. He said, we had, we had onions back over there. We had everything we needed to survive. Maybe the situation wasn't good. We were slaves, but hey, we had something to eat. And God says, fine, okay. Here you go. Manna from heaven. Every day. Every day, manna from heaven. Not once did he break his promise about giving them food. And then what? <laughs> Only a couple verses later do they say, we're thirsty. Moses, have you brought us out here to die of thirst and our children to die of thirst? Give us something to drink. And Moses says, God, I think these people are about to kill me. So what does God tell Moses to do? Okay, strike the rock and water will come forth. And water comes out, doesn't it? And it's interesting, I was learning this in class, that this rock that provided water actually followed them. It followed them wherever they needed to, to be supplied with water. Because we also see later, when God says, Mo, tells Moses to strike the rock again, he says, strike it once, then speak to it. This is the same rock. He strikes the rock, but then he strikes it again. We all know how that went for Moses. It didn't go well. But God provided food, and he provided water. We also see that their clothes never gave out. Right? Their shoes never wore out. God kept the clothes on their backs. It didn't wear out for 40 years. And yet, what is this people's problem? O oh, ye of little faith. They were blinded. They all, it was just material things that kept getting in the way. Material things keep getting in our way, don't they? Don't they? Hello? We worry about, hey... I need to go buy this 24-pack of, is it 24-pack of Dr. Pepper? I can't help it. I love Dr. Pepper. How about Biscoff cookies, Pastor Collie? <laughs> we worry about where our next meal is coming from. The birds don't. The lilies don't worry about how pretty their clothing is. Solomon said that all things are vain, right? Solomon had it all. Solomon got caught up in the world. He was too worried with it. God gave him everything and more. Okay. We get everything we need. Most, or, or, or Solomon had everything. We better than Solomon? Solomon was just like any of us. Just because he had money doesn't mean anything. Just because we have a president who has tons of money means nothing. We still have an eternal destination to answer for one day, don't we? After all these things, do the Gentiles seek? We can see that Jesus is not just rebuking the Gentiles. He's rebuking the Jews who believe in a God and say they worship a God. But yet their faith doesn't show it. A commentator, Charles Eliot, puts it this way. The tone is one of pity rather than of censor, though it appeals not without a touch of gentle rebuke to the national pride of Israelites. You look down upon the heathen nations and think of yourselves as God's people, yet in what you do, in what do you excel them if you seek only what they are seeking? Jesus is saying, if you guys believe in God, don't you think he'll provide for you? Again, he provided for them 40 years in the wilderness. We're all equal. I know that people say it was something big back then, Jews, Gentiles. We are all fallen people who are in need of God's provision every single day for everything. Verse 32 ends by saying, For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Jesus reassures them that their heavenly Father knows that they, have, he, that they need to be cared for and will take care of them because he is all-powerful. And he loves his people. And he hasn't forgot them. And he hasn't forgotten you. 
All that being said, let us now examine ourselves from this same perspective. If you, Christian, believe in God, who is all-powerful, and knows what you need to survive, and will provide for you, He knows what you need. All these things, He knows what you need. Why do we feel we need to worry like the rest of the world? Are we not called to be different? Are we not called to be holy, to be set apart? That when people look at our lives, they see Jesus? If we get caught up in the worry of everything and worrying about what we need next, how can we ever focus on showing them Christ? The answer is we can't. Not if we're focused on this present world. But what does Christ go on to say? I love this. Right when I'm, when I'm worried about something, when I go to this passage and I'm stressed, and I get to this verse, this is where it all changes. This is your solution, Christian. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There it is. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What does that mean? It's quite simple. Look to God for provision. Everything you need. Trust in God. Not yourselves. Don't look to yourselves. It's by the grace of God that you wake up every morning and take a deep breath and put your feet on the ground and that they carry you to work and that your foot presses that gas pedal to drive you to where you need to go. It is all because God has given you that ability. If He chose it not to be so, it wouldn't be. And you wouldn't be sitting here. None of us would be. Not only that, but keep your eyes fixed on eternity. Don't focus on this present world. Right? Hello? Is this not our hope, church? At the end of the day, what do we as Christians have to look forward to? If we had nothing to look forward to, we'd just be like everybody else. But we're different. We're set apart. We're set apart because we're not part of this world. We're passing through. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Right? Look forward to what's ahead if you are saved and believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have an eternal home in heaven that will never be taken away from you. No thief will break in and steal anything. No moth will eat anything and no rust will destroy. Build up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Build up for yourselves earthly re or heavenly rewards, not earthly rewards. To think of what you have waiting for you in heaven will keep you focused on heaven. All rewards beside, what greater reward is there than to be in the presence of an almighty and holy God? Oh, boy. Church, no one's perfect, but I can't wait to, to see Jesus face to face. God knows what we need. Why are we worrying about these things? I get it. It's easy. And anxiety isn't just about clothes and food and, and water. We worry about everything that this world has to offer. And I'm not trying to rebuke anybody in this building. I'm just as guilty as the next man. But God's called us to be different. He's called us to focus on Him. Keep your eyes fixed on me. There's a song that I've heard. It's called, it's, what, what is it? Mom knows this. Uh, fix your eyes upon Jesus. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. What else happens to the rest of the world? It all goes away. You don't worry about it. It, it pales in comparison to what awaits us. When I worry about school, when I worry about anything, I just have to stop, be still, 
Look at who God is. Look at all the things He's done. All the things He's going to do and promise that He will do. And He will do them, church. He's never changing and He is the greatest promise keeper there ever will be. He's going to keep His promises. And one day we will stand in His presence and we'll be able to view Him in our perfected bodies. When I think about that, when I'm thinking about assignment, I'm good. (laughs) This seven-page paper is nothing. This presentation that I have to dub over, it's nothing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, His goodness, and watch how He perfectly provides for you. You might not think it's perfect. God, I didn't want unleavened bread. I didn't want this manna. Come on, I got to make it every single day and I can't store up any extra for myself. How's that fair? I got to make sure I have enough for tomorrow. You just saw food fall from the sky. What's your problem? You just saw water flow from a rock. What's your problem? It's too easy. You say, oh, it's only been a couple months and it was easy to forget. Israelites, it only took a couple hours. We are not better than the Israelites. (laughs) They are God's chosen people. We are adopted into the family of God ourselves. We are not better than the Israelites. And they were not better than the Gentiles, although they claim to be. Why are we worrying? I ask that myself, that question to myself every day. Nick, why are you worrying? You serve a perfect, holy God. Not only did He provide for the Israelites, He will provide for you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Take no thought. Take no anxious worry. Put off this world. It means nothing. I don't know when Christ is going to come back. We have a short time, I believe. Focus on heaven. Focus on God's goodness and how good he is, how perfect he is. The perfect provider. Keep your eyes fixed on eternity. Don't get caught in this present world. I cannot stress that enough. Do not get caught in this present world. It pales in comparison to what we have waiting for us. Perhaps you have a separate issue this evening that you need to deal with. Perhaps you worry about, where am I going after this life? What's after? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He will provide for you. He'll show you the way. You have two pastors in here. I'm not a pastor myself, but I'll be more than willing to show you how you can know for sure that you never have to worry again about where you're going when you pass from this life to the next. And oh, what a life it will be when we get there and see Jesus face to face. What are you going to do tonight, church? Are you focused on this world? Do you not have hope in Jesus? Are you worrying about where you're going after this life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. Pastor Colley, would you come close in a word of prayer, please? Clear and simple, the way Jesus put it. Folks, we've got to get honest about why we're worried about things if we are worried about them because as we heard tonight there's no reason to worry it just depends on where our focus is we get it off of what we want and onto the goodness of God on the person of Jesus if we really do that all those worries fade away and we can get focused on what we should be focused on which is further in the kingdom of God so what are your burdens tonight what are you so concerned about God knows what that ache, what that concern is. He has a plan. And get your heart and your mind focused on my good God 
that's going to provide. Quit worrying and just start working. And God's going to do great things. Nick, I appreciate that. Clear and simple. Praise the Lord for it. Let's have a word of prayer in closing. And as we do, uh, let's not only include uh, Nick and his studies this year, also our other uh, young people that are off at college, and especially Natalie as well, uh, with the things that she's going through. God's got a plan for all of this and more, folks. Everything that you and I are going through, he's got a plan. So let's trust him. Father, I thank you so much for that simple, clear reminder from your word. Lord, this, this is why you preached what you did. This is where we live. These are our difficulties. You know our hearts. You know the, the fears and the worries, Lord, from the simple little things that you promised to take care of to our selfishness that isn't content with what you give us, our forgetfulness. But Lord, help us to know who you are, to get our, our, our perspective right about eternity, to help us let go of our fear and simply trust you and focus back in when we should be focused. Lord, our, our lives right now are so full of, of not only distractions, but also worry. And Lord, it's killing our walk with you. It's killing our service for you. It's killing our ability to worship you for who you are. Lord, we need your help. May all of these things continually prove a point that as you answer our prayers, as you meet our needs, Lord, help us to recognize that it is your good hand that's doing it so that we, our, our faith grows, that our, our trust is settled in your good character. God, that everybody that's watching us will see that God is working and providing and, and changing and doing what is necessary, Lord, so that they see you in us. Lord, they need to see that peace, though. Please develop that in us. Lord, with all the, the challenges that, that Nick is now facing, that uh, Ruth is facing, that all of our young people that are, are stepping up and, and having to face new challenges and new phases in life, Lord, we ask your blessing on each one of them. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit different for every single one, but Lord, you're a God that has every single different scenario covered. Lord, you've got the strength for them to handle a new workload. You're able to help them see and reset priorities like an adult. Lord, to have the endurance uh, to deal with pressure Lord, to work on their character, to develop them more, uh, not only as, and as a, an adult, just socially, but to prepare from, for the, the difficulties of life to continue in service. Lord, I ask that you would give them encouragement along the way. Um, Lord, whether that be through uh, friends, whether that be through family, whether you bring extra blessings along just to, to perk them up and remind them of your hand that's active in their lives, Lord, if you need to send somebody to, to give them a little dose of reality, uh, to, to calm them down and focus them back in, Lord, whatever is needed, we ask that you would bless them with that provision. And Lord, as they see you provide for their basic needs so that they are able to continue to do what you've called them to do, Lord, may you be given the praise for it. So often we, we find other excuses why things happen well, but Lord, we need to see that it was you and you alone. So I thank you for the challenges because it's going to show the, our young people that you are a God who cares for them personally and that you're active. Lord, help us as adults to be good examples of that. Lord, we also think tonight uh, of Natalie and all the, the struggles that she's going through. Father, she needs you. And she's at a very desperate, dangerous place. Lord, we're, we're concerned because of the possibilities but Lord, we are confident that you are, even right now, providing a way for this young lady to see the truth of the matter, that you are God and that you love her and that you can restructure her life based on her relationship with you to not only save her soul, but give her joy and strength and stability again, Father, inside and out, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, God, you have the answers. I thank you for providing those. 
Lord, I thank you for having family members that are in a proximity that can speak to her needs, Lord, that have spoken to her spiritual needs. Lord, we're asking for more people. You're a God of unlimited resources. You know and love this young lady. I'm asking that you would please put somebody in her life right now that can get past all of the COVID restrictions and can give this lady again the message of hope. Lord, you can do that. And I know you want to, and you know when she's going to be ready and in the right openness to be able to honestly consider it. Lord, we know that you're not going to force her to choose you as her savior and to rely on her. But God, we know that you are good and that you want to provide that message in a very powerful way that that will touch her where she needs to be touched. God, we're trusting you to do it. Lord, the results are in your hands. The results are in her hands. But we know that you're going to do everything necessary. Lord, I also ask that you would minister to her family that's going through these struggles at the same time. Lord, the, the, the frustration of not being able to make changes happen is hard, Father, with somebody that you love. Lord, this is just a little taste of what you go through every single moment of every day. Lord, you, you know that things need to change in our lives, but you're waiting for us to get on the same page. Lord, help Melissa to have peace, to trust in you, to be an encouragement to uh, her sister and other family members. But Father, we need you to work in those family members' hearts and lives as well. Lord, all the, all the example that Melissa can give isn't going to force them to change either. We need you to do special things. Lord, praying for Nick, praying for, for Natalie tonight. There are folks in this congregation right now and that were here this morning that need you to touch their situations as well. Father, we don't, we don't know even a fraction of them. I think that knowledge would, would crush any individual in here. Lord, we're not strong like you are. But I praise you for being the God that takes care of birds and flowers and Lord, you value us so much more. God, I praise you for your love. And I thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, help our blind eyes to see it so that we can grow in our faith and trust you more. Use us, Father, however you choose. But we ask these things because of the gift of grace that you've given us through salvation. Thank you for access to your throne that we could ask you tonight, the great God of provision. Help us not to worry, Father, for your glory. In the name of Christ, amen. Folks, thank you very much for being here.